baby hands, huh? Soft baby hands. Oh, that is pretty nice. Not bad. But what you didn't see was Skinny Mini couldn't lift this thing up by himself. He had, uh, he had to have me come do it for him. So, uh, so I may have soft hands, but uh, I can pick up a big block crankshaft, so. What's up everybody, Jacob here with Smetting Performance. This is going to be part two of our 1,000 horsepower, 632 cubic inch, naturally aspirated, big block Chevy build. That never gets old saying. In this video, Shay is gonna walk you guys through how we set up the internal clearances of the entire engine. We're gonna talk about main bearings, rod bearings, piston rings. First, let's start with the crankshaft. This is a Smetting 4340 forged crankshaft. It has six counterweights, which help give it high RPM stability. It also has a 4.75 inch stroke, ridiculous. 2.200 big block rod journal and standard main journals. This is a two piece rear main seal engine. And then we're also running our Smetting 6.7 power rider H beam with a custom JE 2618 piston. This engine is going to be 13 to one compression ratio to help it make the power. So it has a four CC valve notch. In the previous video I said eight cc's but it's actually four. And what's also cool about these pistons is they have lateral gas ports. So let's talk about those for a split second. You can kind of see them better if I put the piston upside down. But right in here above the top ring groove you can see little itty bitty ports going all the way around the piston. And what happens is whenever we have that combustion event happen above the piston, you have a rush of expanding gases. And those gases will sort of come around the piston just a little bit. They'll find their way into the back of those holes, which go behind the piston ring, and it'll actually push the piston ring up against the bore even harder, giving us even better ring seal. Speaking of the piston rings, this is the top ring for this engine. It's a 0.9 millimeter, 4.600 bore and for comparison this is a four inch bore small block Chevy ring and just look at the diameter difference and as well look at the thickness so this is a standard small block Chevy ring compared to our 0.9 millimeter top ring for this application running a thinner piston ring has multiple advantages one it's less weight so we have a lighter rotating assembly there's less weight having to move up and down on the cylinder and two, it's actually more flexible. You can bend it a little easier, and that is a good thing because it helps the ring conform to the bore if anything were to happen. You know, the, piston, the engine block gets a little warm, the bore moves a little bit, this ring will conform and maintain, and maintain its ring seal a lot better than a thicker ring. So the top ring in this engine is also stainless steel, which will help it be more tolerant to high cylinder pressures and extremely high heat compared to a standard iron ring. So put this away for now. Let's talk about bearings. This engine, we're gonna run a tri-metal coated main and rod bearings. You have two different types of bearings. You have tri-metals and you have bimetals. So here's a bimetal non-coated bearing and here's a tri-metal coated bearing. Tri-metal bearings actually have a softer surface finish on them so they can conform to the crankshaft a little better at really high RPM and high stress applications when everything's kind of moving around and whatnot. A bimetal bearing is more intended for a street engine that's going to see lots and lots and lots of miles. We're talking 100,000 plus miles. These bearings are extremely hard on the surface and they also are not coated. The coated bearing is sort of like a dry film lubricant and it's more of a insurance policy than anything. The coating, in my opinion, does not add any horsepower but it also doesn't remove any horsepower. What it does is it protects the bearing if we ever cavitate the oiling system. What's cavitation? Cavitation is at very high RPM. This thing is spinning super fast. It's whipping up the oil because this is a wet sump engine. So all the oil is underneath the crank and the oil will become aerated. And then the oil pump's gonna suck up that liquid but it's also gonna have little air bubbles in it. And those air bubbles aren't gonna do us any good. So if they ever come through, this coated bearing will help protect the bearing, the journals, and the block. We're going to run those bearings with these rings, with all of these really good parts. And that's going to give us a rock solid combination that will last for many seasons to come. The engine block we're going to use is a Dart Big M. 
Again, it's a 4.60 bore, and it's also a tall deck, so it's a 10.2 deck height. And that basically means from the center line of the crankshaft, perpendicular to the deck, what is this distance? Standard big block Chevy is 9.8. This is a tall deck, it's 10.2. The quickest way that you can identify this at car shows or car meets is where does the deck lie against this water pump boss? So right here I have a tall deck and you can see the deck is a little bit above the water pump boss. This is our 540 standard deck. Look how the water pump and the cylinder head are almost in a perfect plane. Going back to the tall deck, a little bit more material right there. The tall deck allows us to run a little bit more stroke in the engine so we can get more cubic inch. Whenever we put more cubic inch in a motor or a combination, that helps everything. We like to think of it as a giant mattress. You put a big guy on a twin bed, it's going to be a little difficult. Put him on a big king, it's a lot easier. You just get more torque and more drivability everywhere. So, Shay is going to torque down the bearings inside the engine block. He's going to torque the caps down as if it was running for real. Then we're going to measure the clearance between the bearing and the journal to determine our oil clearance. He's going to do that for the mains, and then he's going to do it for the rods as well. He's going to pin fit the wrist pins to the rods and then check them to the pistons. And then he's going to gap the piston rings for this application. guys Shay here let's walk through bearing clearance um, a couple things we're gonna need is a micrometer two to three inches um, we need our crankshaft to get our base numbers to determine clearance we're gonna need a dial board gauge um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my micrometer I'm going to measure all the mains on the crankshaft and all the rod journals very rarely are any of our measurements different uh, from journal to journal they're all really precision ground um, they may vary a tenth and there's hardly ever any taper you know from side to side so that's not really something I'm concerned about but we're gonna measure every journal anyway just to verify that nothing's going weird is going on with the crankshaft as far as how it was ground um, and we're gonna take those measurements and we're gonna go to the block and uh, measure our clearance. General rule of thumb is you want one thousandths oil clearance per inch of shaft diameter. So on our mains, for instance, is a 2.75 main journal. Um, so with that formula, we should end up about 2.7 for main clearance, 0 0.0027 of an inch. Um, if it's a little higher than that, you know, 3.0, 3.1, that's fine. Uh, this is a, you know, high cylinder pressure, higher horsepower, maybe a little more RPM type application, a little extra oil cushion is not going to hurt anything. So I'm going to take this and measure my main journal. Get to slide in there. Let's see here. This takes a little bit of a touch, something you have to practice and get used to. That feels pretty even like all the way across. Let's see if we can get you over here, see the gauge. Just shy of zero, about one ten thousandths of an inch. Let's see here. Let's see if we can get this to zero. All right, there we are, zero. All right, we're over here at the block now. I'm gonna take our calibrated gauge and read clearance. So right there is about three, three, one on the front of the bearing. Same three three one. All these journals on the mic on the crank mic'd the same. Um, so I'm just gonna set it to one, and we're gonna go all the way across. There's three zero, oh, perfectly fine. Three one, perfectly fine. Three zero, oh, three zero. Oh. Two nine. We're 2-9 there as well. Let's 
see what our thrust cap is. I don't even know if you can see this far back. 3-0 there as well. So we're 3-0 across the board. Now that we know we have adequate oil clearance, I'm going to hit, go ahead and final install the crankshaft and show you guys thrust bearing clearance. All right, guys, so I have my, uh, damn. Yeah, you know, it's usually like that. All right, guys, so I have my dial indicator set up here. Um, what we're doing here is we're checking thrust, and I'll give you a visual on thrust in a minute. Nice. Um, for something like this, we're looking for five to six thousandths of thrust. As you can see, my gauge is zeroed out here um, with the crank all the way forward and then all the way back. We have five on the dot, which is perfectly fine. Um, I'll explain what exactly thrust is and what changes that and i'll go ahead and uh, install the rest of the main caps So what I showed you guys there was crank in play clearance. So the crankshaft on the, on the rear main has a flame. What we've done is provide enough clearance so that a converter uh, for the transmission or a clutch has enough room to whenever it locks up or whenever the, the converter pushes, it's, it's trying to, the pump in the transmission is trying to push the crank forward all the time. And if you don't have any thrust clearance, there's no room for oil to to be between this surface here and the crankshaft and uh, that's no bueno whenever that happens so you definitely need to provide enough clearance here and here in play wise for the crankshaft to be happy um, that changes depending on power level whether it's a, a big converter no con uh, a very very small like stock style converter that clearance changes typically uh, five to seven thousandths you're never going to have an issue with anything so that's what we shoot for here all right guys so i was going to show you guys pin fitting however uh our cementing rods we have made to our specifications and so we really hardly ever have to pin fit any of these and this one is very smooth uh, no hang-ups at all we measured everything and uh this has about a thousandths clearance for the pin and so uh Maybe we'll do a video in the future showing you guys that stuff. Um, not needed here. So we'll just go ahead and go on to uh, piston assembly. Another thing that these pistons have that we hadn't mentioned previously was, if you can see here, these little holes. Let's see if you can see that. There you go. Those little holes there, that is a forced pin oiler. So what happens is, and a lot of, a lot of aftermarket nice pistons have that. Um, some don't, some do. It's, it's a nice benefit. Um, so what that does is whenever this piston is coming down, think of it, think of it like you're holding a glass of water, right? You have a glass of water and you move your hand down real fast. A lot of that water stays up and it splashes, right? So the same concept goes on here with the oil. So there's oil that's going to be splashed up here into the oil ring and these holes feed down into that hole there. You can see it's, it's cross drilled like this. So um, as the piston comes down, the same concept happens where that, that oil stays put and actually will, will, as it's coming down, will force oil into the pin so you get oil in the pin all the time. And there's a little groove uh, for added oil retention as well. Okay, so these rod bearings here are actually directional. I don't know if you can see that there. It has a, a little L. That stands for the lower, the lower half, so that's this half of the rod. Um, this other half has a U that's for upper so that goes on the upper half of the rod um, they're directional because this is actually a narrowed bearing you see this giant chanfer here well the bearing this bearing excuse me is actually narrower than the stock width bearing and that's to clear the radius on the crankshaft I'll show you guys that so this crank here has a very generous radius. The larger the radius generally helps with strength. Um, you'll see this a lot of times in nicer aftermarket forged crankshafts. Um, and this chanfer here on the rod is to clear that. And there's a little chanfer in the bearing as well, even 
it's narrowed and it's a little chamfer on the end of it. So if you're using a narrowed bearing, be sure that these go in the correct orientation inside the rod. gapping rings but I wanted to give you guys some more perspective on how different uh, this motor is from like your normal even per mild performance uh, regular kind of build so this is the oil ring that we would use in our 383 mild performance application and this is the oil ring that we are using in the thousand horsepower 632 build um, this is two millimeters, so along with all the other rings, they're much, much thinner than than like normal you would normally you would find, and so um, up to up to about forty percent of frictional loss in an engine is coming from the rings alone, and with all these rings being thinner, they also have less tension, meaning less tension on the bore wall itself, which should net us some nice power. So I'm going to gap rings. We're going to gap these about five thousandths per inch of bore diameter. So we're going to end up about 22, 23 on the top ring and about 25 on the second ring.
Okay, Shay just let me know the short block is all finished up. And here it is. It may not look like much, but that is a thousand horsepower, naturally aspirated 632 short block. And now that it's together, you can truly see just how baffling the stroke is. I mean, here's the piston at top dead center, and then four and three quarter inches deeper is the next piston at bottom dead center. And what's also really cool about this engine is the ring pack we're using is so low friction that you can just easily spin over. I mean, I am putting no effort on this 632 cubic inch short block, and it's just buttery smooth. And that's exactly what we want out of this. That's going to free up a lot of free horsepower, and it's just going to work really, really well. So, in the next part of this series, we're going to show you guys how we put on a Jessel belt drive system. We're also going to talk about the advantages that it's going to give us for this application and the tunability of how easily we can adjust the camshaft timing to help tune the torque curve of the engine. So that's going to be really cool. And of course, we'll show you guys that in action on the engine dyno once this power mill is fully put together and ready to make some noise. So make sure you subscribe so you all can catch the latter parts of this video series. And we'll see you all next time.